My name is Chong Hui. Uh, I'm the moderator for today's session. And my job is to keep everyone on track for about 30 minutes. All right? um, I will give a brief to bring on the focus. Then I will invite our panelists to opine on a topic that is at the heart of today's theme of economics and social good in Singapore. After that, I'll open the floor for questions. It will be great if you could get ready your questions as you will already have seen or heard the expertise that we have today. An invaluable chance for you to suss our panelists out on their experience of doing social good. Economic progress is important, but it cannot be premised upon the unbridled pursuance of individual goals. As social inequalities will go unchecked, people will be left behind, and our deep sense of justice will be disturbed, not forgetting the real social problems that will follow. In this context, we are going to invite our panelists to give us their thoughts on the following questions. Why is the advancing of social good an important consideration in the development of economic policies of, for Singapore? And how should the social responsibility for upholding social good be articulated for better awareness and understand, understanding by all in an inclusive economy? Uh, can we start with Chung Lian? Testing. Um, first, it's great to be on a panel. Um, hopefully everyone is not too sleepy after lunch. I think to the first question around uh, the importance of doing social good, the quote that comes to mind is by uh, Winston Churchill when um, he was, this was during World War II and he was asked to fund, uh, fund the arts. And they said, let's cut the funding for the arts. And he said, look, why are we going to war for if not to pro protect the arts and, the, and social sciences? These are the things that make society worth living. And so when you talk about social good, I mean, I, it, it sounds really self-evident that that should be why um, enterprises, why the rest of society is organized around in order to deliver on that. So I'm not sure that that needs to be defended, but the fact that we are in a world where we actually need to ask that question and to defend it probably says something around, around, around you know, realignment of uh, of values you know, collectively. I think the second question on... How should we articulate this goal to our citizens? Yeah, and, and so that gets to the second question. The fact that we need to ask the question means that we actually need to be able to pitch it better. Um, I, I think I really like John Rawls' uh, Veil of Ignorance, which is and if we had to explain the veil of ignorance when I first heard it, you know, it, it, it was really, uh, it, it is a slightly more complex version of do unto others as you would want others to do unto you. And whatever you do, assume that, or, or the golden law, some version of, some version of that, um, I think, is really what we should try to inculcate uh, from a very, very young stage in terms of the values that we provide to our kids. Um, and, and this is where, if there are more opportunities, so a very tactical answer is, if there are more opportunities to do, uh, to, to expose kids, adults, many people to different contexts that may be not necessarily less fortunate, but just to be empathy generating, and there are many, many exercises like this now, whether it's you put on a fat suit or an old suit, um, you know, you force people to walk around with a sack of rice around the tummy to realize that hey, it's actually really difficult to, to be a pregnant woman on, on public transport. I mean, there are many empathy building exercises. I think that's, that's probably the only way that you can actually get this across to, uh, to, to most people. If you don't feel the pain, you won't have the empathy. All right, thanks, Julian. Uh, Li Ching? Well, I, I think the articulation of the need for social good, I feel, will come naturally just as you make birthday wishes, right? I mean, after maybe 25 wishes where you wish for a new acquisition, a new pair of, 
I don't know, a handphone or whatever, it's going to come to a point in time where you start to want to have meaning in your life and you will be making a different kind of birth to wish. So I feel that for our society, it will happen naturally because we have been in a developed status for a long time now. And I can see also with my students each year when you ask them, what would you like to do? The answers are changing. You know, it used to be maybe I get a job and um, I rise through the ranks. But now students are telling me, oh, I want to spend some time in Cambodia. I want to spend some time in a social enterprise. And I have been to Dignity Kitchen uh, quite a number of times because I live near Boon King. And I'm, I'm really happy to see a lot more young people, in fact, patronizing the stores. So I, I'm quite optimistic. I think it will come naturally. We just have to make space for it. And as to the reason why I think also it's, it's self-evident, it is an, it's an innate need in all of us as human beings. Maybe for the past few, well, maybe decades, we have been caught up with acquiring a, a more comfortable way of life. But after a while, when you know, life isn't so tricky anymore. It's natural for people to start thinking about the other people in the society. So why think about it? Uh, I feel the reason is obvious. It's because you are only as good as the other members of the society. I think if you are driving in your, I mean, in, in Jakarta, for example, um, you see a lot of very rich people. But yet what I notice in Jakarta is that when they go and park their car, when they talk to the people who are manning the, the car parks, it's always with such respect. I mean, in Jakarta, they will say park, you know, um, which is here in, in, in Singapore, we will say uncle and all of that. And the, the sense of connectedness between the human beings, I feel if we just make space for it, it will come naturally. And so it's just making sure we drop some of the biases, uh, some of the assumptions, and just give maybe the younger people more space. I feel that will speed things up. Yeah, that's from where I am. Actually, my answer is a question, actually. Why did I start social good? Let me ask you a question. In Singapore, you get guys stay, right? You don't see beggars like what you see in banks, Malaysia, Indonesia. You don't see homeless people lying around everywhere like what you see in London, Frankfurt. And you, most of all, you don't see disabled people in shopping centers. The question I always asked myself when I started this journey was, where are they? I went to find the answer. And then I realized there's another part of Singapore people don't see or people don't want to see. And that's how it started. I decided to make a difference, that's all. By the way, where are the stray dogs? You know, when I was growing up in Singapore, there were a lot of stray dogs, where are they? I can give you the answer later if you want to know. So basically, because of that, I went out and find the difference, and I did, and I realized this is how it started. Social good is not by choice. Social good is a necessity. You need to do it, because in every society, Malaysia, Hong Kong, they're same. There are people who are not as fortunate or not as able as us. So that is why the need. The second question about articulation is, let me give you an example. When I started this journey, I brought a group of kids coming to come and help me to do the, what you see here, right? It wasn't like that. All the kids are on one side playing their handphone. They cannot talk to elderly. They cannot engage elderly. They can, because I, was, I don't know why, they can't engage elderly. They can't help disabled. And that's why we have a game where we get you to play with disabled people. And that's how we started. So the challenges I face is that the question is, society, 10, 15 years when I started projecting it, and now it's very different. Younger people are now coming forward, doing things, engaging them, right? And that is a good sign in our society. In a way, we are progressing. It takes a, it takes a while to help people who are less fortunate, but it all comes from the heart. And I'm very blessed that I've got a very good team of people helping me, that's all. And it slowly kept growing on. And maybe today I can talk to some of you guys, can come and visit in the kitchen for lunch, that's all. Right. So its articulation has changed in the last 15 years. It's changed a lot. Well, well doing social good is important. Um, 
as youngsters, as they grow up, you know, as they uh, get into the uh, into jobs, there's this um, opposite force of uh, uh, wanting to compete, wanting to excel. So, in some sense, wanting to do social good is kind of opposed or conflicts uh, with uh, the de desire to compete. How 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 would you, um, if you have a chance to to um, teach the young, um, inculcate values in them. How how would you balance these two things? What are your thoughts? It's called Dignity Day. <laughs> in 19, 1994, when I first started, when long time ago, like, when I started this project, I one I'm I'm from my background is very different. I'm from mergers acquisition. I spend a lot of time making a lot of money. So basically, I realized uh, if I take one day a month and do something good. Right, that's only 12 days a, month, a year. So I started this thing called Dignity Day. I started with Sporty Soup Park, bring the elderly out once a month, you know, become twice a month. Later, I joined Yellow Ribbon for 11 years. I tell you, I've been doing Yellow Ribbon for many years. Then I decided Project Dignity. So maybe today, after today, you guys can do one day a month, huh? that's all. If you like dogs and cats, go to Sunai Tengah, bring the dogs out, there's 7,000 7, dogs there, you know. Just one day a month, and slowly, you try time to do two days a month, three days a month. Uh, there was a guy who said, okay, I'm Mr. Ko, your dignity day sounds like a good idea. I'm going to plant a tree every day in Singapore, every month in Singapore. You know what he did? He went to find empty space, at night he go and dig a hole and plant a tree because he wants to save Mother Earth, correct? Planting tree. So he plant tree, plant tree, plant tree, until one day he came to say, Mr. Ko, I got a ticket from M Park. <laughs> $50 for trespassing. So I said, what do you want me to do, pay? He said, no, 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 I just want to let you know, M Park does not allow people to plant tree, right? But you see, we may laugh at him. Now he plants three trees. He's he and his son go and find a, Google a nice place and night dig a hole and plant tree. Which is not wrong, you know? He's helping earth, you know, plant tree. So my answer to this is, to balance off the thing, it's one day a month and it's called Dignity Day, that's all. Just go and do a dignity day, 12 days only. Then you bring your brother, your father, your mother, everybody together. I hope I answered that question. <laughs> yeah, I think that's, uh, that's definitely uh, also the point, I think, made by the Nobel laureates, which is you don't have to be too ambitious, and you just have to take that one step. So I think to, to, to just to start the conversation is, is already a, quite good. And then you just think about, okay, how do I continue this conversation for just that one time? And next thing you know, you're there. You know? I don't think they are mutually exclusive. So, I mean, one of the organizations I, I work with is the Center for Social Enterprise. And you have companies that are good, you know, Dignity Kitchen, uh, but you have many. Uh, so I mean, fundament, sorry, your companies that do good, and you have many that are good, which is in the way that they do things. And even if you are, for example, um, a, this is maybe a little bit of an extreme example, but let's say you are a bank, a little bit easier. And banks, pure profit motive, but there are many ways that banks can do things well, whether it is inclusivity, whether it is certain aspects of employment practice, whether it's how they allocate some of their funds to support um, social objectives. So even if the primary profit motive is there, there are many different ways that you can rechannel and support through every part of the value chain, every part of your day-to-day -day operations of a company. And that equally holds true on an individual basis when we talk, talk about starting small. I mean, if you talk about your own time as a portfolio, allocate some part of it to doing social good. Okay, let's... Open the floor. Any questions from the audience? Uh, my name is Dufay. I'm a retired teacher. Um, to what extent is social consciousness the result of previously achieved economic success? Uh, I see, I mean, I see that they, before, before you go into social enterprise, it definitely helps to make a ton of money first in M&A as an investment banker 
because then you don't have to worry about your own living. Uh, so we see why a lot of young people today are interested, in, I see that only in high income societies like Singapore or Western Europe. I don't see that in other places. Uh, to what extent is there a direct relationship between society's economic achievement and then its ability to convert that or improve that through social activities? Uh, I mean, I think that, that that linkage, that observation is definitely true. Um, seen that in sort of many people, but the it's not to say that that you have to have achieved commercial success before you rechannel to do good things. I'll use Gojek as an example. It's not a it's not a super big plug for the company, but really the point is that in 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 Jakarta and in Indonesia, when you had a super bad traffic, b everybody is unbanked, c you know all kinds of infrastructure challenges. Um, Many, many micro merchants, MSMEs, I mean, when we talk about micro merchants, it's really one lady selling Goreng Pisang, for example. And providing a commercial opportunity to uplift everybody, provide employment services, uh, earnings opportunities for the driver partners. I mean, all of that was doing good, generating scale, being relevant, and providing sort of great benefits for all these parts of the ecosystem. And that, that was very much uh, how, how Gojek has, has grown. I mean, you know, obviously very large now. We've got a great valuation. But the foundational piece was not let's get rich. The foundational piece was let's do good. And for us to do more good, we have to scale for us to be relevant. And I think that, that was, if, if you look back even from day one, it wasn't because the PR function has come in and prof professionalized the company, it was really what our narrative was from the very start. And I, I believe that that spirit is something that is applicable across many companies as well. So I'm not just talking about one company or my company, but saying that that spirit is definitely available and accessible, even if the economy is not one that is very high, um, very high, uh, sort of very high status. I think it's definitely a useful precondition, the, social, uh, the, the economic prosperity and all of that, but it should not be a necessary precondition. Like, you don't have to think that I need to first get rich, then I think about helping other people. Because if you have that thinking, you, you're limiting yourself. You're limiting yourself, and then in a way you are prejudging that what I'm able to give um, has to be of a certain standard. I think when we think about advancing social good, m maybe at the, at the bottom of it, it is just reaching out to another member of the society. And for that, it can take many forms. And of course, a lot of times it is um, material well-being, but, for example, I think the, the concept of giving dignity, it's so incredible. And you can give dignity even if you are yourself not rich. So I, I think that the linkage should not um, hold us back, is, is how I think about your question. Yeah. Actually, it's a very good question. I don't know how to answer the question. <laughs> anyway, uh, my answer is very simple. The we start with the I. In any con economy, well done, poor, whatever it is. If you look at Grameen Bank, it started at a poor, the economy is not that great. But all it takes is one person saying that, I want to make a difference, that's all. Whether the economy is good or bad, that person will become growing from there. You'll get people coming in together, joining him, building what it is like now, Project Unity. So, regardless of where the economy where in terms of status, is that per the people inside the economy that makes a difference. So any one of us can, can do good for Singapore, maybe you can go to Vietnam, Malaysia, whatever it is, it's actually to do with that person because the economy is built by people and the people is the one that can make a difference and do the social good. And what my fellow panelists said, 
it doesn't have a big step. It just takes small step to finally get, build something for everyone. I, I hope I answered that question. Prof. Any question on, from the floor? Please. Well, since I'm the one that's teaching on stage, I think I should take the question. Um, interestingly, I, I believe that this was a, uh, the subject matter of a book written by a speaker in uh, a subsequent session. And the name of the book is This is What Inequality Looks Like. Uh, so I will not go too far into it. But um, essentially, the thinking that we should start early have it in the curricula and to build a kind of mindset is definitely a necessary one. The conversation will have to be at the level of policy making. Um, I, from my personal perspective, I, I think that we need to acquire a whole suite of new kind of vocabulary I think the kind of vocabulary that we have been using for the past decade has kind of been stuck in a, in a mode of thinking. And so as teachers, on our part, what we can do is to be more self-aware of the kind of vocabulary that we use with the students. Because from a very young age, language will influence your mindset. So therefore, if with that consciousness that we want to move to a more inclusive society. As teachers, we should every time in the classroom, before we engage with our students, to think very carefully about the, the vocabulary that we will use with them. Even the tone of voice, I, I feel, comes across. And our reaction to difficulties that they face, all of this will go into the mix and so I would very much like to um, see teachers. I mean, I know there is a lot already on the plate for most of our teachers at the primary and secondary level. But maybe if they could just to have a little attention to the kind of vocabulary that is used uh, in, in the classroom, I, I think that would contribute at the ground level to the conversation. We train special needs. And let me explain to you, we have trained thousands of them. Let me tell you the pedagogy. First of all, money is a motivator. They will come. Some of this has never earned money in their life. So to go home, sign the paperwork. I can show you videos of how we get Down syndrome to understand money. Don't under undermine these kids. They know money better than you, right? That's the thing we do. Money is the motivator. The pedagogy for teaching is very different. Food. For example, we teach you to do basic hygiene because without basic hygiene, you can't go into food business. It's a five-day, three-day pedagogy. But all, every day you come and learn 
how to wash your hand, how to wear apron, is always something on the table to teach you. For example, we teach you how to make siu mai. In the course of teaching you siu mai, ha gao, uh, sandwiches, you actually learn from the... Because at the end, they not only are you learning something, you're eating it as well. So food is a very good basis. I know our way of approach to teaching is very unlike you guys. We have to make it work. And we have to teach. The third thing is that we don't look at disability. We look at ability. Meaning if the boy who is deaf, how to get him to communicate. By the way, there's a software on a computer called Transcribe. You can Google Transcribe. We have a lot of software that we can use, even translate everything. So we actually, in a tablet form, the deaf person, or teacher talk, you can see how we did it. Our class is not 20, 30 people. Our class is only six or eight, because I screw up big time last time. I thought I can train a lot of people. It doesn't work. Different disability require different time skill to train. And every time we have six, we have to place it with job. If one can place job, we have failed. So the pedagogy, the approach, and more importantly, you mix different disability. So in the class of six, there's a single mother, there's a Down syndrome, there's a deaf person. We got even partially blind, right? You'll be surprised in Hong Kong, the girl is blind. When they say they're blind, they're not exactly 100% blind. When they say they're deaf, they're not 100% deaf. They can still hear. So we look at them as individual, and we focus on getting them through the whole process. Our success rate is 100% placement. There's a reason why. I can tell you the secret. I can place you job 100%. It's called Singapore quota system. If you don't understand what, just Google it. Just. So we actually get them 100%, but the staying rate after one year, we actually take a towel, is 60% after one year. Hong Kong cannot compete, neither can Singapore, we complete. So the idea I'm telling you now, let them work together, different disability. Secondly, change the pedagogy. Our pedagogy is based on food, you're based on other things, whatever it is. Motivate them, that's the most important thing. For teachers who are keen to know what we do, why don't you sit in our class? Our trainers, by the way, are not teachers. They are Singapore Airlines girls. Imagine the airline stewardess can handle 400 passengers in a plane. They can handle any special needs kid. So the, pe the way we approach it is completely different. All my chefs are executive chefs. And Singapore airline girls, after 40, nobody wants them because they're considered old. But don't forget, when you can run the whole SQ catering service, uh, you're damn high up. And we use those people to come in. By the way, if you know any SQ girls who are looking for a job, let me see it. <laughs> I'm not kidding you, seriously. So, for teachers out there, the approach is look at the pedagogy, look at the individual, use and more than mix different hours disabled, you know, and look, train them, work with them. That's how we succeeded. Maybe it's not your way of doing it, it's our way, and we succeeded. What we do. So, for those who are interested, can always come and see me, and then we can run you, show you the whole curriculum. I can even give you the whole curriculum if you want. Right. So, it's sharing of information, that's all. Your question. You know any SQ girl? Let me know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay. Any further questions? Please. Uh, I have another issue that interests me very much personally. And that's the issue of inclusion. Having been a teacher at major US universities, I taught at Stanford and Michigan, my job, the worst job that I had was always grading papers, to sort out the mistakes of our admissions department, to make sure that those who de didn't deserve it did not get a degree from those schools. How do I, how do I, Con reconcile that with inclusion. Inclusion, I sometimes, as I listen to it, it's in accepting everybody on a random basis. But we have to sort out because people are not the same. Their efforts are not the same. I remember when I was 15, I had lots of other interesting things besides studying. Fortunately, my mother straightened me out. But uh, I mean, a lot of people are not so lucky or think to be straightened out. How do we reconcile inclusion with selection of quality of performance? That's for me, is a major issue that I'm struggling with. Can I answer that? To be inclusive, uh, 
It's like going fishing. You need a bait to catch a fish. Every corporate now has to do CSR because it looks nice on them. So what's the bait? Bringing the elderly for lunch, let them come and feed the elderly. Pack meal for the poor, you need the bait. So the bait for us is actually, may not be right, but the bait is to engage these people. Because they have to do their CSR, they have to do their ESG, whatever it is. So whatever, how do we do in Crazy? We create events like that. Come and work with the disabled, play with the, run a hawker store. You need to create the bait to catch the fish. And the fish is all this corporate. You don't start with telling, oh, I want to help you to break. No, because the corporate has to do something. Why is corporate? Why school? Why institution? From there on, you, you know, it cascade down to the individual. Our motto is very simple, to engage you, to educate you, and finally to inspire you. That's, the, that's how we did inclusiveness. The bait to catch the fish. Different, well, not a different view, but sort of a corporate perspective on that, which is that in any enterprise or in any undertaking, there are things that are foundation, there are things that are core, there are cardinal, and there are things that are ancillary. So in a company, if you say something, for example, gender, orientation, um, ethnicity, these are not cardinal to the job. In things like that, where there should be, I mean, those you should just be completely inclusive. There may be issues where it is sort of cardinal to the job. Uh, some a very crude example, if you're a manual laborer and a manual laborer sort of requiring physical movement, and if you cannot move physically, let's say a soldier, my previous em employment, um, then you cannot do that particular role. But are there roles within the company where you can use it? I think Ford was one, was one of the first examples where he says, um, how many roles in my company don't require someone to uh, uh, sort of move around? And he took a stock take audit of that. How many of these white collar work, uh, sort of office work? And he said, I've got X hundred of them. I can staff all of these with people that may be mobility challenged. And he did. I'm not sure if this is a true story, but it's a very nice story. And that's from a, about a hundred years ago. So even within an organization, at a, if you look at it granularly, there are many different things that are cardinal and not. If you're, a student, if you're a teacher, and then it is around, has the student demonstrated mastery of the subject, I think that is a non-compromisable. But if mastery of the subject is, can you write an essay within three hours, that is where you can probably flex around timing, um, around the conditions of the test, for example. Again, I'm not an educator, but I will just say that um, things are non-cardinal, things that are cardinal, but if you look at it more, you know, narrowly, I think there are still opportunities to provide affordances and allowances for people that have uh, different abilities or different backgrounds coming in. Yeah, I, I think there's definitely a lot of challenge in deciding on who should we include when we talk about in inclusion. Um, but I think it's a moving goalpost so the tricky part is probably that if we are fixated with a set of parameters, so if we are fixated and if I say, if I want to give a, an A to a law paper and I must always look for in, enough citation of cases, good analysis, great evidence, great vocabulary, if I'm fixated with that, then the concept of who should I include will never change. So it is important for us to constantly be having a discourse and conversation about those, those parameters that we are, we're gonna use. I think you, you, should have, you should have something to guide you. You can't say, no, everybody should get an A in my class. But if you're fixated about how I should give the A, and you're not gonna change even though for the entire of your tenure, this is how you have been grading, then I think that's a problem. Because when I was in law school, the way uh, an A would be given is totally different now from how I should get an A in law school. So it should be a constantly in evolving consideration, but it's gonna be tricky. 
as to what do we agree will be the set of parameters. And I think um, it shouldn't deter us. We should still have the conversation, but um, maybe just to be open about who we should include and who we should, for the time being, exclude. Uh, that would be how I, I would look at your question. OK, it's uh, lunchtime. I can hear some sounds of restlessness now. But just to let everyone have one more chance, is there any more um, really pressing question someone would like to pose? One last question or no more? Then we may adjourn for lunch. OK, if not, let's put our hands together to thank our panelists.